Well, welcome to our online service. I'm David and I'm the uh, Vicar of Holy Trinity Barnes and you're really welcome uh, if you're joining us for the first time. It's uh, great to have you with us. And we, this morning, we've got a great service in, in store for you. Stephen is continuing our series on the Beatitudes and we're talking about the, the looking at the question of hungering and thirsting uh, for righteousness. And we've also got a, an interview that Nicky Gumbel did recently with an entrepreneur called Anthony Tan. And he's just telling some of the story of how uh, his faith works I itself out in, in, in what he does, in, in work, founding this company and the company that he founded. And uh, it's just a really interesting uh, interview uh, as we think about what it actually means to work our, our, our faith out, work righteousness out in our daily lives, in our work. And many of you work in, uh, in businesses, you lead teams, you... Uh, um, and 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 this that's where that's where the the, the cold face is. So Anthony is just sharing some of his uh, stories. Nikki interviews him, so I hope that will be uh, interesting and an encouragement uh, to you. A couple of notices. The first is ongoing prayer. So there's a prayer we pray on a Monday now. Of next Monday, we're going to pray at Monday at ten a.m. and then Sunday at six p.m. Uh, just for personal prayer. If you've got anything you'd like prayer for then please uh, do, uh, do come. You go in a breakout room and we'd love to um, pray uh, with you and for you. But let me pray for us. The, uh, uh, let me pray for us. Lord, we, we just commit this time to you and I ask that you would reveal your goodness and righteousness to us this day and that you would fill us with your spirit as we listen to your word, as we listen to what you have for us. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen.
I'm thrilled to be here with our good friend, Anthony Tan, uh, who I, I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that Anthony is one of the most successful young entrepreneurs in the world. Um, but we've known, uh, we, Anthony, I've, I've known you, I, I was thinking it must be almost 20 years uh, that I've known you. And um, in those 20 years, we've seen so much change in your life uh, from, uh, um, when I first met you, I think you were a student, and now you've become the founder, co-founder, CEO of Grab. Just to give a, give people an idea of the scale, it's it's valued at, at more than 14 billion US dollars uh, in the eight years since it began. You have 9 million drivers in 352 cities, eight different countries. This is an extraordinary story of... Um, one of the fastest growing companies in the world. That's one change. Another change is uh, from a carefree single man to um, now a devoted husband and father of three children. And uh, I just heard a fourth one on the way. Uh, but right. then the other thing, just the other thing I've observed is, is your faith. Uh, you know, I've watched your faith absolutely blossom. So I, I want, I'd love to talk to you um, First of all, you know, to start with why, I mean, why, what was the motivation behind this uh, company? You know, we, first of all, uh, I, I just want to share, I'm, I'm truly honored, Nikki. Um, you've been a big part of my life, you and Pippa. Uh, when you asked to do this, uh, how could I, how could I say anything but yes? You know, as I shared with you the last time, I have Bible in one year app. I listen to, I've heard it for, I don't know how many years it's been in existence. I've heard it four years in a row. So I've done it four years, every day for four years. So you can imagine my whole family, everyone in the household, all have heard your voice and people's voice every day for four years. <laughs> well, and, and I, you, but you're one day ahead of everybody else, aren't you? There's, oh, I'm, now I'm like three days ahead. So I, <laughs> I, I, I we'll go way, way further. <laughs> uh, so, so it's changed my life. Uh, a, a really big shout out. Again, no, no incentives at all for me to say this, but the only incentive is that it has changed my life and I hope to see it change everyone else. Um, and you know, this morning I, I heard it before before speaking to you as well. Of uh, no fear, and there's absolutely no fear uh, as we speak. Um, so let, let me first start with that. To your question about mission and why, you know, we we believe we exist to drive Southeast Asia forward by elevating the quality of life for everyone, and and this has been our guiding light since 2012. And my calling has been how do we use this platform to truly serve the millions of people that really need help right now. So, so you know, go, re rewinding on, on, on how this has all happened, you know, when we first came back from business school, it was really about helping the safety, especially for women in the taxi industry. So since back then, it's really among, you can obviously assume that all people are bad eggs, especially taxi drivers in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. But what we said was, no, that is not the case. In fact, let us find a way technologically to help them increase their incomes so that they have something to lose and so that they will not do anything to hurt other people because they treasure and value their jobs. And please keep in mind, most of our drivers in Kuala Lumpur during that time are, are not Christian. 
In fact, most of them are of other religious faith. But we said it is not about just serving only Christ-centered people. It's about serving all people and making sure that we can make, whether it's women feel safer, children safer to go to school, taxi drivers earning more income. And that has continued because we believe we have to serve the unheard, the unseen, and, and the underserved in Southeast Asia. Brilliant, Andy. I mean, I've had two great motivations to get people jobs and keep get and allow people to travel safely, and and particularly for women to feel safe in a in a taxi. I think it's kind of public knowledge that you were you were up against Uber in the early days, and uh, it wasn't clear who was going to come out as uh, on top. But uh, I think. And maybe one of the things is you, you knew the culture, you knew like it was a cash culture, you knew, you knew that ice creams weren't perhaps the easiest things to take around um, uh, and all those kind of things. But uh, you came out on top, but you, you're now in a partnership. The CEO is on your board and you've, you've formed a really good relationship. H how did you do that? Well, that was one where I would say today, Dara, who's the CEO of Uber, is on my board and He's, we've become dear friends. Who would ever imagine? But really, it makes all the difference. And, and again, it's easier to say on hindsight. Of course, do I still... Are there people who, who you know, slap me on my right? And, and have I given my left yet to slap? Uh, that hasn't happened yet. Um, but, you know, as I said, Nikki, and that's why I keep reading uh, Bible One Year, uh, I, I still need more of that. But I've heard you quote um, like iron sharpens iron. I'm to see your competitors not as like the enemy, but also as kind of like the arm that sharpens you. That's right. Um, I I honestly have quoted that so many times, whether it's in Bloomberg or Financial Times, and uh, they always ask me, you know, uh, well, you, well, what's what's a business book? You, I said my favorite business book is the Bible, um, <laughs> and it is true. Iron does sharpen iron because. I've seen how they've pushed me to extremes. And I could have, in those extremes, I could have done really bad things to hurt them. Or I could have just said, let's just out-innovate them. As you said, that the, at that point of time when we were competitors, you know, Uber had a great campaign then called uh, Uber Ice Cream, on-demand ice cream. And you know, we said in this environment in Malaysia or Indonesia or Vietnam, it's really hot. Um, it's going to melt. So we did uh, grab durians. And, and durian, I, I know it's an awful fruit for many, but you know, Southeast Asians love it. It's the king of fruits. And it just took off, right? And it was this idea of constant innovating on demand ideas, highly localized, that really won the hearts and minds of customers. You worked unbelievably hard. And at one point, actually, it nearly took you out. You were working too hard. How, how do you get the balance now in your life? The balance is hard. Um, I, I've always told our guys, um, our teammates, that it's impossible to achieve work-life balance. Uh, what we call it is, I say, I tell them, you know, work-life harmony. Um, so today, you know, as we speak, I have a stepping machine right here. Uh, as <laughs> so I literally on my conference calls, I, I'll, you'll be seeing me stepping. Um, so I have that because I, I'll be standing, so I don't sit and stand for 15 hours a day, 16 hours a day uh, to burn calories at the same time, right? Um, and it keeps the energy levels high. At the same time, you know, in the mornings, I keep, say, 20, you know, like you, uh, you know, I know you wake up very early to play squash and all that. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've had the opportunity to just, because of Bible in one year and it all being an audio, I can do my stretching in the morning while listening. I can go for my walks, you know, while, while getting that quiet time and praying at the same time. Um, and, and it's that it's being able to merge a few things together and not compromising. Of course, could I, you know, could I just work 24 hours? It's, it's humanly possible, but I, it's not good for the soul. And, and I felt that having this work-life spiritual harmony uh, has made me into a, a, a better, more empathetic, loving leader. And also you prioritize your relationship with Chloe, I know. 
and I, I mean, it's quite, sometimes people, you know, like prioritize, think they should prioritize their children above their wife. But I think you've, you've, you've made sure that, of course, yeah. your children are a high priority, but you, even above that, you prioritize your relationship with Chloe. That, that, that's very true. Uh, we've made it a point whereby we believe that the love that we show for each other and the love we show for Jesus together will always take precedence even above the children. And I've always made it very clear to Chloe that Jesus takes above you, you will take above the kids and, and then the kids. Um, and the reason is because our children, like us, we always look up, right? We saw the relationship between Jesus and God and we saw that love and we use that to inspire us to be more like him. Our kids at a very young age look at myself and Chloe, and they see that as love. And we believe that by showing each other tremendous respect, by showing each other tremendous love, by being extremely respectful day in, day out, you know, I've been working from home for, for the nine months. You know, you can't hide uh, any disagreements, but even, and because we always went back to the word, and because we shared of equal yoke and we had the same values, we could always sort things out so quickly in front of the children. So the kids never saw us have fights. The kids never saw us. You know, the kids, I see how close the children are and how much they love each other, siblings. And I can see it's a mimic of the love that Chloe and I have shared. Adi, I mean, you've talked a lot about your Christian faith. Just say, what difference does that make to the way that you, you do your job and how and how do you sustain that faith in a very in a very tough kind of environment uh, I pray a lot um, I pray a lot Nikki I pray a lot I ask a lot of people for prayers um, I surround myself with with a lot of Christ-centered uh, leaders and 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 partners uh, across and great advisors consistently seeking lots of advice. And I know because they're all centered on faith that the wisdom comes, is the root source is the Bible. Then it, it, and then we pray together and then it comes through their mouths and it comes with their worldly experience and it comes to me. And then, it's, and then I pray how that can then be executed correctly in the, in the real world. I know it. <clears throat> You've got Bible verses all over your your office there. Um, yeah, look at all that, all the Bible verses. Look, look, look at all these Bible verses. Uh, yeah, again, it wasn't me. It wasn't. Uh, it was my wife who, who writes post-it notes of Bible verses that talk to her, and then she pastes it around all my screens. And what are the the particular verses? What are your kind of life verses? Well, the one that's staring right below your the, the, the Zoom screen is uh, from 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And it's the ability to be weak and understand that we are weak and, us, and admit we are weak and rely on him totally. And that's really tough. And that's why I have it literally in front of my face to remind me all the time. <laughs> final, final question. Anything that you would want to say to people? Who, supposing there's a, a young person watching this and thinking, wow, I'd love to do what Anthony's done. Um, uh, what, uh, but, but, they're, but they want to do it as a follower of Jesus. What, what advice would you give them? I think that there's so, so much. I mean, the number one is, Again, I'll, I'll say this, the best business book in the world is the Bible. And the best way to read it is Bible in one year. <laughs> Hear it. It's changed my life and continues to change my life. <laughs> Anthony, you're very kind. Thank you so much. Uh, you're the busiest man in the world, so I, I won't keep you any longer, but thank you so much. You are, you've been an inspiration. Yeah. So grateful. Thank you. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for HDB. Thank you for Alpha. Thank you for this team. Uh, you have no idea um, the impact you've made in, in my life, in our lives. 
and uh, that's my son Emmanuel. And uh, you know, when we couldn't put him to sleep, I would put your Bible in one ear. <laughs> People use it. People use it. Get their babies to sleep. In fact, anyone get anyone to sleep <laughs> listening to the Bible in one year. It's the best <laughs> cure for insomnia. That's right. You remember I brought him to service. Uh, you know when he was speaking, and he recognized it. But boom, he fell asleep. <laughs> Has that impact on everyone? <laughs> you still have. Uh, you still have your fan here. <laughs> Hello and welcome to this new part of the service, Check In and Pray. Basically, you have two and a half minutes to check in and, and pray for someone who has been sat on your mind this week. I know, speaking from personal experience, that um, I can um, have someone sat on my mind that I need to text or, or just need to check in on. And then sometimes I can forget because my week can be pretty hectic at times. Uh, but this is the perfect time within the week and within the church service to just be able to text that person and to check how they're doing and to pray for them. And if you have a few minutes or a few seconds left, then top up that coffee cup and enjoy the rest of the service. Thank you. This week is Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 to 12 and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. One day as he saw the crowds gathering Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Well, good morning. Everyone, uh, my name is Stephen, for those of you that don't know me, and we are yeah, going to jump into the Word of God, and we are going to continue our journey through the Beatitudes. Uh, and, and this week we are going to be focusing on Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, 
uh, which says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. John Stott, in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, which this begins, uh, he, he says of the Beatitudes, he says, The more we explore their implications, the more seems to remain unexplored. Their wealth is inexhaustible. We cannot plumb their depths. Truly, and he quotes the German reformer Martin Luther, truly we are near heaven here. And that is such a powerful way to, from somebody that has clearly attempted to plumb the depths of these incredible statements of this, this beginning of God's kingdom and this new covenant that is being established. And it's just, you know, I think that's when we come to the Beatitudes, you know, to sit with them, that these are weighty things. It's such an important mindset as we approach it. So as I said today, uh, we are continuing that journey as we have been on the last few weeks. Uh, and today we come to this, this verse 6, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And it's important that we see that, that, that hunger is such a, a very thing that we can understand. Hunger is very human. Uh, we all experience hunger and thirst. And, and Jesus was surrounded by people who hu were hungry and who were thirsty. And sometimes that was very physical, that crowds would come and they would get hungry. He would meet people who were drawing water because they were thirsty. Jesus himself experiences hunger and thirst as he fasts and prays and as he lived a human life. Sometimes people hungered for things that were more sort of figurative. They would hunger for riches. They would hunger for wealth. Sometimes people would hunger for healing. To grasp and to follow Jesus has never been about desiring wealth or riches or power or authority. So many of the people Jesus interacts with, that's where their hunger and thirst is. They do anything to maintain power. There's this, this drive and this need, I need to feed this. I need more. I need more. But to follow Jesus has always been about to seek the kingdom of God and righteousness. And even there would be a good place to stop and evaluate ourselves and our motives and what drives us to do the things that we do. Right? As Jesus also says, where, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, what is the treasure? What are you hunger, hungry for? What are you thirsty for? Because that is going to drive your decisions. That's going to drive the way that we live our life. We can say that we value something, but if actually our actions don't line up with that, do we really value that? Or do we hunger and thirst for something different? Where do we place our time? Where do we place our energy? As we've come to know God and we've put our faith in Him, we have got right with God. We have come. We have been forgiven. We have been set free. We, have, we are now standing in righteousness with God. The, the legal aspect of righteousness is that we are now in right standing. That we can now come into relationship with God and there is no, there's nothing holding us back from that. That when we think about individual righteousness, that we have been declared righteous. Or as Paul tells us about Abraham, that all he did was believe and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That we recognize that, that all we have done is to put our faith in Jesus. That as we come to him, he declares us righteous. Through Christ, we are restored back into that right place with God. And so in some ways, righteousness seems like something that we don't need to strive for. We don't need to hunger and thirst for it because we have already received it. The, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were striving 
for their own self-righteousness. They were declaring themselves righteous. And Jesus had some things to say about that. That actually it wasn't about what they did that made them righteous, but it was, it was always about faith in Jesus that declared them righteous. But hunger, being hungry and thirsty for righteousness is not just about your own personal righteousness and your standing with God. Again, Martin Luther, uh, the German reformer, uh, said, said this. He said, the command is not uh, to crawl into a corner or into the desert, but to run out, if that's where you have been, and to offer your hands and your feet and your whole body, and to wager everything you have and can do. What is required is a hunger and a thirst for righteousness that can never be curbed or stopped or sated. One that looks for nothing and cares for nothing except the accomplishment and the maintenance of rightness, despising everything that hinders this end. If you cannot make the world completely pious, then do what you can. And, and Luther's point is that the point of receiving righteousness is not that you just go and hide away in a corner and go, oh, thank you, Jesus, that I'm righteous. He says, no, that the outflow of that is so important. He says, you need to look around you and see that you are living in a world that is so unrighteous. And we need to live with that, with that unsatisfied taste in our mouths, that, that thirst that sits there that you can't leave. If you've ever gone without water for a whole day or you've forgotten to bring water or, you know, hunger, we feel it, right? It, our whole bodies are saying, I'm hungry. Thirst, when it gets into our mouths and our throats, you can't ignore it. Every time you swallow, every time you do anything, you feel that pain of thirstiness. Just that's what you should be feeling about the unrighteousness in our world. The, the, the Bible is filled with ideas of hunger because it's something so easy for us to understand. Not only will Jesus feed the hungry, literally, he will feed thousands of them uh, several times, but also, he dis and, and in that, he will also describe himself as being bread. That he is the true bread of life. And he will sit with a woman at the well who draws water and say, if you would only taste the living water, you will never be thirsty again. He places himself into those things and says, he is the one who satisfies truly our hunger and our thirst. Psalm 42, a very famous psalm, begins by saying, As the deer <clears throat> pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. And that picture of a deer panting for the water, we're not supposed to have this sort of, you know, beautiful, pristine English countryside view of trees and grass and this, you know, beautiful, you know, sort of Bambi walks across and takes a nice drink. No, th this is... This is supposed to be an image of, of desperation, of being close to death. This is an animal that is, is bones are sticking out. That is, if it doesn't find water, it's going to die. We're probably supposed to see a sort of arid desert view as we read that. And the author of that psalm is saying that that's how my soul longs for God. It's like if I don't get him, everything is gone. I'm at that place of desperation. Do we feel that thirst for righteousness in our world? Do we feel that thirst and that hunger of that, that pain and that agony to say, God, we need your righteousness. The way that you have brought me close to you, that I am righteous. Lord, I will give all to see that righteousness fill the earth. Do we act like that? Do we... Care, do we hunger and thirst? How can we, even in these next few days and in these next weeks ahead, how can we act in righteousness? How can we bring 
righteousness into our workplaces, into our families. We should look different in the way that we act because we are thirsty and hungry for righteousness to, that we have received to flow outward into the world. And Jesus says that those who do that, those who hunger and thirst for it, he says that they're blessed, that they are happy, they are joyful. This is good news. And that they will be satisfied. That they will, they will have that, you know, gut-wrenching hunger and thirst for it that will be quenched, that will be satisfied. Jesus offers us his righteousness. May we strive and work to carry that righteousness into the world. May we model his righteousness in the places where we work, in the places where we travel, where we walk, wherever we are. May we ask ourselves that question, God, do I hunger and thirst for your righteousness? And how can I do that? How can I do that? As Luther said, and I'll read the, the beginning of the quote again. The command is not to you is not to crawl into a corner or into the desert, but to run out if that's where you have been, to offer your hands and your feet and your whole body and to wager everything you have and can do. What is required is a hunger and thirst for righteousness that can never be curbed or stopped or sated. One that looks for nothing and cares for nothing except the accomplishment and maintenance of the right, despising everything that hinders this end. If you cannot make the world completely pious, then do what you can. May we seek the Lord to do what we can and to hunger and thirst and move in that to bring his righteousness into this world. to the altar.
Stephen for that um, that word from the Beatitudes and uh, just that I guess ringing in my ears as I've heard that word is, is where you landed you know where it says do, do what you can and, and of course none of as you as we've heard none of us are none of us are entirely sorted out none of us are righteous but it's Jesus's righteousness and I just want to pray for you right now pray for us right now Just invite the Holy Spirit. You might want to close your eyes. You, you might just want to take some space. And I just invite the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Just think of that encouragement that Martin Luther said to run out and offer our hands, our feet, and our body. And Lord, we just, we do that. We ask you to fill us with your love and power. And Lord, for those of us who we just think, well, I'm not, I'm not really that hungry, <laughs> or I want to be more hungry, I say, Lord, Lord, give us that, that hunger within us. I just encourage you just to say that to Jesus. Just say, Lord, make me hungry for you. You know, that wonderful picture of the, of the, the desperate deer. So thirsty. So, Lord, I pray you'd make us desperate for you. And I pray your blessing over us. The blessing of the Father who loves you, loves you, loves you blessing of the son who loves you and gave his life for you and the blessing of the Holy Spirit who fills you with all that you need for this day and this week ahead in Jesus 